This take from Gilbert Arenas may be disrespectful. Oh, Jokic can win his championship. No one's going to care. Let's just be honest. I'm sorry. He's not going to go from where he is right now to this super mega star because he's not doing anything kids want to see. However, this take from Stephen A makes that last take look kind. This dude, and I mean this affectionately, just some big tub of lard. No one, however, well, maybe Kendrick Perkins, but in terms of the volume of receipts, tops the simultaneous confidence and wrongness from Nick Wright. Wright has more than torn into Jokic time and time again, and should quite frankly lose his job over it, considering what you're about to see is likely a big reason why the Nuggets and even other teams across the NBA aren't as marketable as they could be, because not just Jokic, but whether it's another MVP candidate or merely any player who gets caught up in a Nick Wright agenda, almost magically and not so coincidentally, loses popularity based off the overbearing annoyance fans feel towards Nick, as opposed to actually focusing on enjoying victory for the players or even themselves. That's how sadly frustrating a Nick Wright segment can get. Take a listen. You are not, not Jamal Murray that. away from being this bad. It, Jokic plus Jamal Murray plus the unknown that is Michael Porter Jr. is not winning the championship. It is. He's a really, really good player that calculators have wildly overrated, and the playoffs will continue to show us that. Okay? Well, Draymond Green, who's five inches shorter than you, is so much more impactful on winning. It's a joke. So, it, you know what's also a joke? MVP awards now, evidently. So ridiculous. So, yeah, I was right. All the media nerds were wrong, and they got to eat it for another four days until this series mercifully ends. No, I, I just don't want him to be the MVP, and he's going to be. Ah! Nobody actually believes in the Nuggets, even though they're now fully whole, because they know the Jokic thing was totally a joke. I do, however, believe in the Clippers. I'll have to ask my accountant about that. In 60 years, folks are going to be like, oh, man, how many titles Jokic wins? Like, oh, none. Did he get unlucky? Nope. Nobody actually even expected him to win the title. <laughs> what about the one seed? People, no, the, the, the same voters who are demanding, if you don't vote Jokic, you don't understand the sport, ask them who they got winning the West, much less the title. <laughs> and you know what they'll say? Teams who have players who are better than Jokic, but they're not actually better than Jokic, but they play defense and then get a bucket better. But have you seen Jokic's vorp? Not that I'm passionate about it. It just bothers me, Colin. <laughs> we used to have standards in this country. Will I apologize? for not wanting to let him skip steps, I will not. But shifting from Fox Sports to ESPN, and this next narrative from Kendrick Perkins is beyond incomprehensible, it's racist. As much as ESPN's agenda makes a big deal of ending racism, they evidently don't put their money where their mouths are in this case, or as we'll get to later, really in any case. So when it comes down to moving the goalposts for certain individuals to win it, why didn't he never bring up this in particular subject? Maybe your best course would be to tread lightly. When it comes down to guys winning MVP since 1990, it's only three guys that won the MVP that wasn't top 10 in scoring. Steve Nash, Jokic, and uh, Dirk Nowinski. No. <laughs> what do those guys have in common? I'll let you sit, I'll let it sit there and marinate. You think about it. Why is this subject not brought up? What do those three guys have in common when they won the MVP for us? Steve Nash, Dirk Nowinski, and Yoki that wasn't top 10 in scoring. So I understand exactly what you're saying. I don't disagree with what you're talking about. Kendrick is more than implying here that Jokic, Nash, and Dirk were MVPs because of their skin color. Today, that talking point from a shockingly still-employed ESPN analyst finally gets accounted for once and for all. Not only will we back up the recent first-time champion Jokic, but the two innocent bystanders who got caught up in all of this, Dirk Nowitzki and Steve Nash. A generationally innovative seven-footer that could put it on the deck and do a little bit of everything. In 0607, when he won his lone MVP award, Dirk Nowitzki was tied with Tracy McGrady for 10th in scoring, so the not top 10 in scoring point from Perkins was actually wrong. Regardless, one of, if not the greatest European player ever, Dirk led anyone even amidst the top 15 in 0607 scoring in field goal percentage. Dirk also led anyone amidst the top 27 in points per game in three point percentage. Nowitzki became one of nine players to this day to post a 50 40 90 season in this 0607 campaign. 
Dirk was the number one option by far on a Maverick team which he fueled to the best record in the NBA with 67 wins and just 15 losses. That Dallas team in 2007 to this day is knotted up in a six-way tie for the seventh greatest record in the 76-year history of the NBA. Topping off the reason for why it was a well-deserved MVP season, the most lethal pure stretch big of all time in Nowitzki led all of his fellow top 10 scores in rebounds per game. Chalking up Dirk winning this award to his skin color is not only racist, but it's dead wrong. Moving on to Steve Nash, and while his short-lived coaching career tarnished his resume, in his 05-06 MVP season, the Hall of Famer in Nash joined the 50-40-90 club. At the time, only Larry Bird, who did it twice, in addition to Mark Price and Reggie Miller, were the only players to have ever shot 50% from the field, 40% from three-point range, and 90% from the foul line in a season. The way Steve Nash had the adeptness and skill to get downhill all the way into the lane and dribble through the paint before kicking it out, in addition to how he generally didn't force things offensively, not to mention was one of the toughest players ever, made his impact felt well beyond the stat sheet. On the second best team in the Western Conference, the greatest point guard in Suns history and the greatest Canadian basketball player ever led the NBA in true shooting percentage. Nash also led the NBA in assists per game by a mile. Steve's gap between the second-ranked Baron Davis in assists per game exceeded the gap between the second-ranked Davis and the number eight-ranked Allen Iverson. While Nash wasn't a top 10 scorer, Steve was the most efficient player on one of the best teams in basketball. For example, the product of Santa Clara, born in Vancouver, shot the third highest percentage from three-point range among all of the top 30 scorers in the NBA. In 2005-2006, Nash also led the entire NBA in assist percentage and free throw percentage. Better yet, Phoenix's second most important player that season in Amari Stoudemire played exactly three games, so Nash had to put the team on his back. Nash would do just that, carrying the Suns to a 54-win season and the second seed in a more stacked than ever Western Conference. Phoenix would go on to beat the LA Lakers in the first round of the playoffs. You could argue Kobe should have won MVP given his insane 35.4 point per game average, but the Lakers were seventh in the West, while the Suns were second. Team success has always mattered. Shaq was also in the discussion for both the 05 and 06 MVPs and claims Steve stole both trophies from him. But Nash was in his prime and Shaq's heyday in LA was already behind him. A year before that, in Steve's 04-05 campaign, his 11.5 assists per night was the highest average in a single season in exactly a decade at that point. Nash was additionally at the very least top 9 in all of win shares, win shares per 48 minutes, offensive win shares, offensive box plus minus, and true shooting percentage. Steve's 88.7% free throw percentage was 1.3% away from giving him a fifth season in the 50-40-90 club. Nash's four appearances in said club still double the man with the second most such seasons up to this date in Larry Bird. Perkins slapping Nash with the he won it because he was white label is more like a slap in the face to both Steve and everyone he naturally inspired to love the game of basketball. And finally, Nikola Jokic's 2021 and 2022 campaigns. In 2021, Nikola was tied for 10th in scoring, so we catch Perkins in another lie like the Dirk season. Jokic led the league in win shares by 4.3, a number that matched the gap between the second-ranked Gobert and the number 24-ranked James Harden. Jokic led the league in value over replacement by three, a number that matched the gap between the second-ranked Curry and the number 27th-ranked Towns. Nikola additionally led the league in box plus minus, player efficiency rating, and offensive win shares. Jokic was also at the very least top four in defensive box plus minus, defensive win shares, and win shares per 48 minutes. So much for the narrative that he doesn't play defense. Then, in his 2021-2022 MVP season, in terms of non-advanced stats, Nikola led the league in triple doubles, rebounds per game, plus was the only player aside from Atlanta's Trey Young to be top six in both points and assists per night. Also, Jokic was top five in total points scored. However, it's the advanced stats where the argument from Perkins that Nikola only took home the award because of his skin color gets utterly exposed. 
Jokic led the league by a wide margin in all of box plus minus, offensive box plus minus, value over replacement, offensive win shares, win shares, win shares per 48 minutes, and player efficiency rating. As I mentioned, he led the league in rebounding, so this next fact becomes that much more impressive, being that Jokic was second in defensive rebound percentage, plus third in total rebound percentage. And if you're wondering about his defense, he led the league in defensive box plus minus, and was .1 behind the first-ranked Jason Tatum in defensive win shares. The disrespectfully racist inclination that Jokic, Nash, or Nowitzki won the award because of skin color is stunningly off-base. The fact that ESPN keeps Perkins around signifies that they're on board with said inclination. The actual common denominating trait recognized amongst most of us, aside from the fact that they're all white, is that Jokic, Nash, and Nowitzki all played with an utterly skill-based style of play, which in turn made up for their lack of physical advantages. However, it's the bigger picture that legitimately speaks volumes here. ESPN just made a boatload of cuts to employees including Jalen Rose, Max Kellerman, Jeff Van Gundy, among many others. None of these analysts, or across the course of history for that matter, have uttered out of their mouths that any given player in any given sport won or lost any given award because of their race. If there is a case you can track down where that did happen, said analyst would have immediately lost his or her job. In terms of ESPN, Paul Pierce lost his job a few years back for an Instagram Live where he was partying. For some reason, we just keep seeing Kendrick's face pop up on our screens, despite the provably racist, rooted in zero fact narrative that he spread like a virus this past March. It really shows you where ESPN's priorities lie. They're not concerned with racist comments being spewed toward either side because this adds to a far from dignified trend amidst the network. Most recently, we've seen Malika Andrews make headlines for unnecessarily calling out the criminal history of African American men in the NBA. Perkins and Malika, two of ESPN's biggest contributors, each with their own race-based biases, will continue to be a few of the primary voices representing the NBA, and that's a damn shame. Let me know your thoughts on both this racism and generally the amount of hatred that's been spewed towards Jokic and company down below. This was D-Flow, and I'll see you next video.